RN Afternoons with Michael McKenzie. I got a letter, an email, in fact, about two weeks ago now. Let me read part of it out to you. Dear Mr. McKenzie, I'm sure you don't know who I am, but hopefully after reading this, you might consider the subject line to be true. The only way you might recognise me is that I was given the Moth Story Slam tickets and I hope to perform at the event on Monday, which would mean a lot to me, as I'm attempting to become a storyteller, much like yourself, though in a bit of a different way. I am a vocational storyteller, which is the made-up way of saying I want to have 50 different jobs and tell stories about them. I've just graduated university, and I was most recently a tour guide in Alaska. I've been a waiter, a ranch hand, a film producer, a camp counsellor, and other things. But the point is not the jobs, but rather the love of stories, and in the feeling how interwoven we all actually are. I'm sure you know this and get a profound sense of joy every time from the work that you do. And then it goes on to gush about how fan- fabulous I am. So, of course, I invited him in to gush some more. He's with me now. Taylor Soblowski, welcome to RN Afternoons. Thank you. Now, it so happened, Taylor, that we booked you in for today. Last night you went to the moth and you won. Yeah, that's correct. I tried to do the best I could for you so you'd have a... Yeah. A story to tell. Also. I know. Yeah, because oh, yeah, I would have kicked you out <laughs> otherwise. <laughs> otherwise, it's just a stranger in yes, here. Yes, yeah. a stranger in a strange land. Uh, and Taylor, later on in this hour, you will return to perform once again the award-winning story of last night based on the theme of Busted. But tell me why it is you chose, well, first the title, but also the career of being a vocational storyteller. Uh, before I went to university, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, as most people, I feel, find themselves in. Uh, and it wasn't because I didn't like every, anything. I feel like it was because I liked everything. So I could have been an astronaut or an engineer or a car mechanic or a doctor because I, I liked all of those things. I just didn't know whether I would like doing them forever. So I thought, why not try them all? Uh, but in, in saying having all of those adventures and doing all those things, it still feels kind of purposeless. And then I came upon stories and I really enjoy telling stories and being in front of people and imparting wisdom and good nature and whatever people might need. Uh, And so just having all of these adventures and posting pictures on Instagram doesn't really do anything. (laughs) But if you have stories to tell and you can give somebody some some piece of your life, I think that makes it more purposeful. How do you reach an audience when you don't have a stage like The Moth to perform on? Uh, Right now I have a website uh, that I post things on YouTube. So I do kind of just audio recordings uh, on a weekly basis to keep myself fresh. Um, you just improvise the story? Uh, I write them down and then record them. So similar to a live performance, but it's just online and there's, depending on, you can listen to it at any time you want. Um, so that's my main thing right now. Uh, as far as storytelling goes. And the grist for your stories are the adventures you have as you travel the world doing whatever job presents itself. Yeah, so a lot of my stories, well, all of them as of now are true personal tales, uh, but... Do you, you think know, people the, know when you're lying? <laughs> I say I never lie, I just kind of exaggerate, make the story more interesting. <laughs> they're well, all, yeah, they're all the reasonably art. true, yeah. Uh, the reason I ask is I think there is a certain amount of authenticity that people are always searching for, well, generally, but also particularly in modern life. And uh, if you have tell a t- you know, tale about Alaska, and fine to embellish, but we do want to know that what you're telling us is in some way the truth. Yeah, I think that one of the one of the best things one of my teachers and mentors told me is every great story has four things, a beginning, a middle, an end, and a point. And a lot of people that have these great embellished stories, we miss out because they're sort of missing that fourth thing. Why does it matter? How did you change? All of those important things that give it that reality. So you can embellish as much as you want Mm. with the beginning, middle, and end. And it can be a great story, but also not a great story if you don't have that fourth thing. And that's the humanity and the... That's intriguing. So there's a parable. You think it's a parable at the end. Yeah. Are you you from America? Yes. Where were you born? In Florida. In Florida. The reason I ask you that is because something I've struck... As a discussion point, with the moth coming to Australia and RN and RN Afternoons being involved in its sort of media outlet, is that there is a cultural difference, I believe, in storytelling between Americans, I'm not sure about Canadians, but certainly Americans and Australians. And that is, Australians don't necessarily need a lesson or a parable. Uh We tend to be kind of, and that's the story. 
You know, take it or leave it. We don't care. <laughs> Whereas it seems to me that from, from what I've heard from the American moth storytellers is that they want you to come away having seen you transformed by your own experience. Yeah, I think that's a big thing. Something I learned, I went to film school, so it was very much learning about stories and storytelling and that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, so I think a lot of it was imparted in that way where I, I really, when I tell a story, think what is the most important thing to me? Why would this matter to somebody else? And really great stories also sort of leave it open-ended as well, as far as, well, maybe you get this out of it, or maybe it was told really well and that's what you learned, or maybe mm. it reminded you of your grandma and that was enough. So yeah, I think right. there's that's a cool. bunch of different ways that you can tell stories and still have them have that point. That's a great yeah. thing to say. Uh, do you find you have to check yourself sometimes that you are not trying to create a situation that will become a great story? Yeah, I actually, there was one time uh, recently where there was a homeless guy and he said he needed this exorbitant amount of money. And I thought, and I, I was able to give him the money at the time. Uh, and I thought, you know, this is going to be a really great story. And he came back to me and it was this whole week long thing where he had to get a bus to another city. And his father had this big inheritance. And all my friends were like, you're so dumb for giving this guy all this money. He's never going to give it back to you. And we had this really serious, intense discussion in front of our apartment. And my apartment flatmates were looking from the window, hoping I didn't get stabbed by this guy. And... Uh, he said, you know, because I was graduating and then I was going to go to Alaska. So I told him, I was like, I only have three days. He said, I promise you, I'll give you all this money back. I'll meet you here at 9 a.m. And then he never showed up and it really wasn't a story. And I was upset because yes, it is. I had. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's what I learned from it, too, is it was this big thing that I wanted to be a certain story. Either if I got stabbed by this guy or he gave me the the, a lot, the money back. I don't think you want to <laughs> wish to be stabbed by anyone. Well, yeah, Tyler. but either way, it would be an interesting story, but it kind of fell well, for Not if me. you're dead. Not yeah. if you're dead. <laughs> but yeah, I take your point. Yeah. So um, it didn't work out how you wish, but in some ways, that's Australian that actually at the end, he just disappointed you. We're kind of comfortable with that yeah. in this country. Yeah. That's kind of the parable for us, you know, yeah, disappointment, so <laughs> disillusionment. <laughs> so sometimes I'll get in those situations where I'll think, or I'll purposely follow someone because they look interesting. But it, it, I think it adds to your life as well because you end up talking to strangers and emailing radio people. and Like you know, me. Doing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> doing things so, you wouldn't otherwise. So you've been a ranch hand, a film producer. You've worked as a tour guide in Alaska. What are you doing right now? Uh, still sort of on the job hunt. I have trials with some places, uh, a bike delivery place. There's a taxi rickshaw kind of service by the beach and then some bars and restaurants as well. What are you thinking? I mean, if, if they all offer you a job, which one would you take out of those options? Uh, probably all of them just because the bike, <laughs> <laughs> the bike delivery service lends itself more to the afternoons and then the bar restaurant stuff lends itself to the evenings and weekends. So I feel like I can balance all of them. The And the bike delivery service is not as frequent. Um, so you could do bike delivery in the morning, deliver people on rickshaw in the afternoon, yeah. then arrive at the restaurant bathed in sweat <laughs> for a good night in the kitchen. Exactly, till one in the morning. Yeah, That is the, brilliant. Yeah, Taylor, brilliant. you've got it all planned out. That's brilliant. How long are you staying in Australia before you move on? Uh, at least for the whole summer. So uh, six months or so. But we'll see what happens. It took me 24 hours to get here. Uh, so... That's what it takes. Well, yeah, yeah, from where I was, 24 hours. So Alaska flight time. to Australia via your parents in yeah, the US. Yeah, And then are you doing it alphabetically? Are you moving on to another <laughs> country like Belize or something? Uh, no, it might be an interesting idea, but that's a whole other thing that I haven't thought about. So I think you we'll should. See. Yeah, <laughs> Do it alphabetically. Now, let's go to Bolivia. Can you go to Bolivia? Probably. I haven't looked into it yet, but we'll, <laughs> we'll see what You've happens. You've got six months to think it out. Yeah, exactly. Now, the, the mission for you, should you choose to accept it, is to come back and be with me again in about 20 minutes' time because we'd love you to – and we've never done this before. Uh, we have normally have a moth story that we put on the radio every Tuesday as a mm -hmm. way of telling people about the moth coming to Australia. And as you took out the moth in a community slam last night in Melbourne – we thought, let's do it live. So if you don't mind, can you repeat your award-winning story of last night? Yeah, yeah, no problem. Okay, so the theme is Busted, and Taylor will now go away and ponder his options about Busted. Do you think you'll be changing the story before you come on the radio? Uh, probably not. Good. I we'll no, I want to hear yeah. what you did last night. Yeah. Yeah. Because it obviously it won you. So that's Taylor Zablowski. He's back in about 20 minutes' time. He's a vocational storyteller. And while we pondered that, here's some new music from a bloke who's coming to this country again for Blues Fest next year at Byron Bay. His 
Well, his stage name is City in Colour, and you might even know the song. Smartphone app. We met my next guest, in fact, in the last hour, only in the last 40 minutes or so. Taylor Zablowski is back with me in the studio. Taylor, you're back because not only are you a vocational storyteller, but you use your professional powers for good and evil for your own advancement last night when you won the Story Slam for the Moth in Melbourne. So we've invited you back in today to actually repeat your prize-winning story for everybody who normally hears the moth at this time, we've never done this before. This is going to go live to where from Taylor. His concept he has to speak on is the theme busted. Taylor, over to you. Thank you. I wanted that sombrero. I wanted it so bad. But I would never get it because Evan was my partner, my amigo for Fiesta Day. It was a sixth grade. There were two things wrong. Well, there was a lot of things wrong with me in the sixth grade, but there were two main things wrong with me. The first one was that I was friendless because I thought it would be cool to be smart, which is literally never true ever in life because the people that are cool, that are smart, are cool because they have social skills. The second thing that was wrong with me was that I was oblivious, especially to new sixth grade things like drugs because... All I knew was that you did drugs and then you died, which didn't seem right because I knew everybody in my school was doing drugs and nobody was dying. And things like kissing, which I know that's how oblivious I was. I just knew that people were going behind lockers and in bathrooms and putting things up to their faces. Uh, But it was okay because being friendless and oblivious kind of cancel each other out. And in the sixth grade... Uh, We had this home economics class where they teach you all the things sixth graders need to know, like how to sew a pillow, which nobody ever needs to know ever, uh, how to fix a flat tire, which you don't need to know until six years later, and how to cook Mexican food, which I could definitely get on board with. We had something called the Fiesta Day, where we went into the banquet hall and the sixth graders in the home economics class Uh, decorated it and cooked all the food and served the food and the rest of the school came in and had a great time. And they put us in these Amigo teams for Fiesta Day and the best Amigo team got to wear the sombrero. Now, I didn't have to be smart to know that this thing was cool. It had purple sewn-in fabric and green tassels hanging down and a big tag that said Party City 499. I knew that if I got to wear this sombrero, I would be cool. But I got paired with Evan. He was scrawny and had a beaky nose and a bowl cut, and he was the designated creepy kid of the sixth grade. He wore all black all the time, which I know you're thinking, that doesn't sound creepy, but our school uniform was a teal polo, so I don't know how he got away with it. Uh, He had Tourette's, which is a real medical condition, but in the sixth grade, it's just classified as creepiness. And I don't know if he was oblivious or not, but he was definitely friendless. So we got paired together. And it's the day of Fiesta Day, and we're in charge of tomatoes. Four things. Wash, cut, scoop, serve. So we get to the banquet hall, and immediately Evan dips out, and he's like, I have to go to the bathroom. So I'm over washing the tomatoes all by myself, and I look, and Evan is nowhere, and I'm cutting all the tomatoes by myself, and I look, and Evan is nowhere. He better be taking the biggest poo of his life, and now all of the other students from the school come in, and the mariachi music is playing, and the sombrero gets brought out, and now I'm scooping all the tomatoes by myself, and I look, and Maracas is wearing the sombrero, which is okay, because they were doing a good job, and I scoop, and I look, and Tortillas is wearing the sombrero, which I was fine with too, and I scoop, and I look, and Tablecloths is wearing the sombrero, which I know was just a pity sombrero, because all of the tablecloths were askew, and I'm so angry, I throw my ladle down, and run over to the bathroom, and push the door open, and... I only thought that people went to the bathroom to take huge poos. I didn't think they went in there to kill themselves. And I look, and Evan is sitting on the floor. He's shaking, his face is white, and he's holding a pair of scissors up to his neck. He'd been in here the whole time. And I look at him, and I say, Evan? 
Are you doing drugs or kissing? And he smiles, and I smile back, because I know that I caught him. And even though I was definitely still oblivious, in that moment, both of us knew we were no longer friendless. And the teachers and the nurses and the parents and the counselor found out. And for the next two years, Evan and I were paired together for everything, from group projects to field trips to any time either of us had to go to the bathroom, because they thought that we were friends. And they were right. I wanted that sombrero. I wanted it so bad. But Evan was my amigo. And I'm okay with that. Taylor Soblowski with the award-winning Moth Story that got in the Slam Prize last night. There'll be more Moth Stories on the radio here on RN Afternoons and also live on stage in both Sydney and Melbourne with other states to follow. And the good news is we've had word from Moth headquarters that some of the Australian performers that have been on stage in the last few months will have their voices on the radio very shortly indeed.